Science of Winning podcast episode number two. Hey, sports champions, and welcome once again to the Science of Winning podcast, your number one source for learning how to win in your sport, where each week we dive into the minds of championship-winning athletes and coaches to discover how champions think and what they do to achieve athletic success. I am your host, Lyndon Gortney. Now, if you're ready to dominate your position, outsmart your opponent, crush the competition, win more games, and achieve your athletic goals, then I have a free gift for you. Head on over to sportstrainingsecrets.com where you can download the first three chapters of my book, How to Win at Sports, 10 Proven Principles Marines Use to Win in Battle. All right, we are glad you are back with us today here at the Science of Winning. To start this episode, I want to go ahead and recap our last episode so you kind of know where we've been and then we can move forward into where we're going today. So in our last episode, it was our introduction episode. We laid the foundation for what this podcast was all about. We gave some examples of teams who have used the principles of winning to win their games and to uh, to achieve their uh, athletic goals. Um, we learned that competition and combat are governed by the same principles, the same uh, rules determine who wins in combat, in warfare, that governs who wins in competition, like sports competition. You know, great generals are great because they win wars, and great coaches and athletes are great because they win championships, multiple championships. We talked about the scientific method for finding the principles of winning and how we uh, discover those. We also talked about how the, the principles that we apply have to be repeatable. They can be used again and again to get the same results. Next thing we did is we uh, talked about the vision we have for you here at the Science of Winning podcast. Our vision is that we want to help athletes and coaches achieve their sports dreams and accomplish their goals. We want to make sure every athlete in the world and every coach in the world has access to these proven principles of winning. The third thing we talked about is we wanted to let you know exactly what to expect for our future episodes. So just as a recap, each week we'll be giving you access to athletes and coaches who have won multiple championships so that we can learn how they did it, so you can learn secrets and hints and tips to try to achieve the same things in your sport. And lastly, I gave you a short introduction into who I am and why I'm doing this podcast. Uh, again, I'm a, just a, I'm a Ph.D. candidate. I have a master's in sports coaching and sports psychology. I wrote a book entitled How to Win, 10 Proven Principles Marines Use to Win in Battle. And I have helped many teams win championships, win leagues, win their season, win state championships by applying these exact principles that I'm going to be discussing through our first uh, 11 or 12 episodes of the Science of Winning podcast. All right, today we are going to discuss, first off, I want to introduce you to the big three. Now, what are the big three? The big three are the first three principles of winning in sports. I call them the big three because they have the most impact. These suckers, if you do nothing else but apply these three principles, you are going to get some amazing results. Teams that apply these three principles instantly improve their chances of winning. So what are the big three? Here we go. Number one, the first principle of winning in sports is to find and attack your opponent's weakness. The second principle is to stick with what's working. And the third principle is to find your opponent's strength and neutralize it or shut it down. All right. One, find and attack the weakness. Two, stick with what's working. Three, find your opponent's strength and neutralize it. Now, guys, just so you know, uh, I am a big fan of of repetition because repetition is what we do in practice in our sports it helps us sharpen our skills and abilities and it is the same thing in in learning something new the more you repeat it the more it sticks in your mind so sometimes I'm gonna hit these principles multiple times and from several different angles that way it helps you learn them and helps you not because if you if you learn these principles if you just know them in your head but you never get to where you can apply them and use them in your sport you've wasted your time. It's not going to do you any good. So we've got to get these principles in your mind and we've got to get them to where you can access them and use them and apply them. All right. In this episode, you're going to be learning about the first principle of winning in sports, which is finding and attacking your opponent's weakness. So let's get started. All right. I got a story for you. Uh, in our intro episode, I talked about, I told you a story about playing on a men's basketball team where we were the better team. And, uh, but for whatever reason, at halftime, the team that we were playing against just was 
sticking right there with us. I think we were ahead by two points at halftime, but we should have been just crushing these guys. So uh, I had told my teammates that I had been researching this subject of winning and discovering these proven principles of winning. And uh, I asked my teammates if they wanted to, you know, uh, try to learn and try to apply these principles right now immediately in this game. And they said, heck, sure, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. So I told them these big three, these first three principles of winning in sports. I introduced them to this idea of finding your opponent's weakness and attacking it, of sticking with what's working, and of finding your opponent's strength and neutralizing it. So I told them about that, and I said, okay, let's see how we can apply these things. So I said, first off, find their weakness and attack it. I said, what is their biggest weakness that we have been able to exploit this entire game? Somebody said, well, we're a lot faster than them. They're slow. We're able to drive around them, drive past them. We're able to get to the paint, and they are incredibly slow compared to us. So I said, all right, let's keep attacking that weakness. Let's keep driving past them, getting into the paint. I said, okay, number two, stick with what's working. Okay, so we ask, what has been working in this game? Well, have we made uh, any three-pointers in this game? The guy said, uh, nope, haven't made a single three-pointer in the whole first half. I said, okay, let's stop taking threes. No more three-pointers the second half. I said, how have we been scoring? They said, well, we've been getting layups. We've either been driving past and beating our defender, going up and shooting a layup, or driving past, getting uh, getting into the paint, driving past the defender, getting to the paint, and dishing off for an easy layup for a teammate. I said, okay, let's stick with that. If that's working, let's keep doing it. And lastly, I said, what is their strength? What is their biggest strength? How have they hurt us the most? And let's neutralize that. So we looked at the score sheet, and we saw that they had two players that had basically scored almost all of their points. So I said, okay, let's do this. Let's not let those two players even touch the ball. Let's get up in their face. Let's put a hand on their chest, get between their hands. Let's deny them passes. Let's just frustrate them. Let's make their teammates not even want to pass them the ball. So that's what we did. Uh, we said, let's make the other guys beat us. Let's make the teammates that haven't been scoring, let's make them beat us, but let's not let their good guys beat us. So what do you think happened? We, uh, we went out after the halftime and activated our little plan. And at the end of the game, like I said, in the first, uh, the first episode of this podcast, at the end of the game, we looked up at the scoreboard and we had beat the team by 20 points in the second half. We absolutely annihilated them by applying these big three principles. It was awesome. Now, uh, in my book, I, it's it's entitled 10 Proven Principles That Marines Use to Win in Battle. So I want to give an example. You know, I've told you that combat and competition go hand in hand and are governed by the same rules. So I want to give you an example of what this is. Just again, like I said earlier, I like to repeat and give you different angles and different angles approaches, uh, different stories so that it can stick more clearly in your mind. Okay. So a group of Marines have been given a task to find and capture a, an enemy combatant and he is at this base, it's a secured fortress with walls and guards and security systems and all this stuff. And he is holed up in there and the Marines have been given a task to go out and capture this guy and bring him home and get back safely. All right, so that's their mission. What do you think these Marines are going to do in order to successfully accomplish this mission? You think that as soon as the order is given, they run straight out the door and just drive over there in their Humvees and attack this mission and try to er, this uh, this little combat this little fortress and try to take the guy in that way i don't think so that is a fast way to get yourself hurt or get yourself killed even so that is definitely not the way they do it one of the first things they do is they look for a weakness in the fortress in the stronghold they're looking for walls that are short that they can easily get over they're looking for cracks or holes in the wall. They're looking for doors that are unlocked or that would be easy to get in and out of. They're looking for underground entrances to the sewers. They're looking for a possibility of dropping in from the sky, maybe out of a helicopter with a parachute or a fast rope or something. They're also looking at the guards. They're finding out what are the guards' patterns, how do they walk, where do they go, when do they, uh, when are their, when their back turned to a certain area, when do they make relief, shift relief, so that you know, they, do they make shift relief at their post or inside the, the fortress, leaving it unguarded for a certain amount of time? 
they look for you get the point they they also look for like weapons what do the uh the people in the fortress have that could hurt them what do they have uh sniper rifles they got machine guns they have rocket propelled grenades you know explosive claymore mines they're looking at all this kind of stuff to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of this fortress because they want to find that weakness they want to find their end the best way that they can get in accomplish their mission mission and get out safely so that's what they're looking for and if they want to have the greatest chance of accomplishing that mission that is the very first thing that they're going to be doing gathering intelligence to find out what the weakness is of this uh this group and this fortress all right now it doesn't matter if you're an athlete or a coach there's a good chance that you grew up around video games and you know that when you're playing a video game and you get to the end of a level you get to a character called the boss Usually at first, the boss seems very difficult to beat. But the one thing that all bosses on video games have in common is they all have a weakness. And it usually takes the shape of some sort of pattern. Once you figure out the pattern, you usually can easily beat the boss. Now let me give you an example. I grew up in the 80s and we had Nintendo and there was this game called Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. And I absolutely loved that game. So when you're playing Mike Tyson's Punch-Out and you get to one of these characters, for example, Soda Popinski. And Soda Popinski reaches back to throw a cross. Well, all you got to do is jump up and punch him in the face. Or when he squats down to throw an uppercut, you just punch him in the stomach. Or when he rears back to throw his super spin punch, you just dodge eight times to get away from those spin punches, and then he's all dizzy and his head's all, his eyes are all, you know, spinning, and you jump up and punch him in the face and you knock him down. You find his weakness and you attack it. Alright, or another example for you more modern game players, maybe a uh, PlayStation 3 or 4, uh, or Xbox 360. If you ever played the game Batman Arkham Asylum, uh, when you're fighting the Joker at the very end of the game, he's the final boss, Batman versus Joker there. You, uh, the whole, the pattern for him is you try to stay away from the Joker until he charges you. And when he charges you, you jump out of the way and he runs into an electrified fence, stunning himself. Then you run over to him and you just beat the brakes off of him. That's how you beat the Joker at the end of the Batman Arkham Asylum. Sorry, I guess I should have said spoiler alert for some of these because, uh, now naturally you can probably find out all these things just by doing a quick Google search. But, uh, yeah, they do have a couple spoiler alerts on, uh, on beating video games. Uh, but the point is, if you don't figure out the boss's pattern, aka if you don't figure out their weakness, then it will be very difficult and even sometimes impossible to beat the boss. But, when you do figure the pattern out, you can easily beat the boss every time. Now, sports are like this. Every athlete you compete against and every team that you compete against has a weakness. The first principle of winning in sports is to find this weakness and attack it. Now, I know that sounds just completely obvious. I mean, obviously, you would, you would attack their weakness, right? But how often do you, when you're playing your sport or when you're coaching your team, How often do you truly think about the weaknesses of your opponent? If you're like most athletes, and even most coaches, you rarely think about this, even though it seems completely obvious. Now, one of the things that the best athletes and the best coaches in the world are incredibly good at is finding their opponent's weaknesses. Once they find that weakness, defeating them is like defeating a boss in a video game. It actually becomes almost easy. Now, again, I want you to, I'm going to repeat this. I want you to realize this. Every athlete has a weakness. Doesn't matter who they are. The greatest who ever played the game, the greatest in their sport right now, those guys have a weakness. In the same way, every team has a weakness. Every single time you go out on a field or on a court or on a pitch or in a rink and you line up against another team, you've got to look for that team's weakness. Also, every time you line up against someone across from you, whether it's a a man defending you or a woman defending you, whether it's someone trying to block you, whether it's someone pitching against you, whether it's uh, someone you're going to wrestle against or fight against in MMA, you've got to do this one thing. Find that guy's weakness. Because once you do, you can tear him up. All right. Now, So we've talked about the fact that weaknesses are important to find. So how do you find these weaknesses? What are some things that you can look for to identify a weakness and attack it and exploit it? 
All right, so let me give you a, 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 some help here. There are basically three categories of weaknesses. Three categories. They're real easy. All right, one is physical, two is mental, and three is their tendencies. All right, so their body, their mind, and their actions. Okay, mental their physical body, their mind, and their tendencies. Okay, so let's jump into these a little bit more specifically and see how we can use these to exploit and find these weaknesses. All right, the physical weakness. Usually these are obvious. They're very easy to see. They can be gauged uh, with the stopwatch. They can be gauged with uh, you know just basic observation. They're very easy to see. Physical weaknesses usually take the place of size, speed, or strength. You don't know that, that phrase, bigger, faster, stronger. If you see somebody lined up against you who's smaller than you, or slower than you, or weaker than you, then you've got an obvious physical advantage over them. They've got an obvious physical weakness that you can attack and you can exploit. All right? For example, now let's play, let's say you're playing basketball and you've got a seven footer on your team. The center that plays on your team is a seven footer. And you look across at the other team and all the guys over there, they've got nobody over six feet tall. Well, that is a glaring, glaring weakness of the other team. Your seven footer, you just gotta post him up, throw the ball up high, he catches it, turns around. The guys can't even jump high enough to knock it out of his hand. I mean, he's that tall. That is a huge advantage. Now, I'll give you another example. When I was a kid, uh, I had four brothers. We remember I told you in the last video, my older brother Lars, and then me. And then Lance, Lark, and Luke. Now, we used to play basketball, driveway basketball, about every single day. And when I was growing up, my younger brother, Lance, was uh, about two years younger than me, or a year and a half. And I, I pretty much always had a physical advantage, uh, size advantage, up through high school, you know, over him. And when we would go out in the uh, on the driveway and we would play one-on-one -on -one basketball, I could have beat him every single time we played. By how? By attacking his weakness. And his obvious weakness was his size weakness. I was at least six inches taller than him. Well, I could have just turned around and backed him down underneath the rim and then picked up the ball, spun towards the rim, and made a shot. He could never block me. He could hardly even contest it. That would have been a way that I could have won every single game growing up against my younger brother. Now, obviously... Growing up, you're developing skills. You know, I wanted to learn to drive left and drive right and spin and do all that stuff. So there were many times I lost games because I wasn't just trying to win. I was trying to develop my skills. And uh, now there came a point where Lance outgrew me and his basketball skills surpassed mine. And uh, now if we were to play one-on-one, -on -one, I would be uh, hard-pressed to win one out of ten games. He's uh, he's definitely got the advantage on me. But for those years that I had that size advantage, uh, I definitely could have beat him uh, every time we played. So that's an, another example of physical weakness. Uh, let's let's say you're playing, uh, playing football, and uh, you're the offensive line, and you are just so much bigger than the guy across from you, right? And you, every time the quarterback snap or the, the, the center snaps the ball, you can manhandle the guy, the rusher, the defensive rusher that's coming across the line to try to uh, tackle your quarterback. So what do you do? You tell your quarterback, hey, we've got a hole over here. I can make a hole on my side of the, of the, of the line anytime you want it. So the quarterback and the coach, they they become aware of this thing. Smart coaches and smart quarterbacks say, okay, let's run the ball up that hole all day long until they find a way to plug that hole, until they find a bigger guy to rotate over to that side and try to hide that little guy, hide that weakness. So that is another example of that physical size disadvantage or strength disadvantage, that weakness that, that the other team may have that you want to exploit. And we could go on and on and on. If you have questions about how to find a weakness in your sport, uh, please go to our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com forward slash science of winning podcast and shoot me a message out in there. I, I want to respond to that. I want to get more clear, uh, clarity. If you have any questions on these principles that I'm talking to you about, let's get on there and have a conversation and, uh, I'll either answer your question there on the Facebook page or I will make it into a full out podcast and we can, uh, you know, address it through a podcast because I'm sure if one person has a question, there might be lots of people that have the question as well. So, uh, again, anytime, any point that I go over, please, please reach out to me. Science of Winning Podcast, um, 
there at facebook.com forward slash signs winning podcast. And let's, let's have a conversation. And cause I, my goal is truly to help you win and help you find these answers. All right. The second area of weakness are mental weaknesses. Okay. Mental weaknesses take several forms. One is, uh, maybe the players on the team doesn't know the play, right? Or maybe they don't know the positioning or maybe they don't work well with their teammates or maybe they lose focus and get distracted. And maybe they're timid or scared. These are, these are mental weaknesses that you can easily exploit. Okay. For example, don't know their position. All right. Hockey player, uh, hockey team, they're, they're attacking, right? And they're, uh, they get a, uh, they get a power play. Okay. So the other team has, loses a, a defender. And, uh, so they're having to play this four man zone with a goalie while the, uh, the offense, while your team is attacking. Now, you're observing that one of the players that's on the ice on the defensive side just is constantly out of position. He is, he keeps just screwing up. It's so hard for him to, uh, to know how to play off his defenders. If one defender goes out to put pressure on the puck, he, he doesn't know how to rotate back to fill that spot or he goes out with him. So you got two people going after the same puck, leaving a huge opening on the ice. That is a type of mental weakness where they don't know the positioning. They don't know how to work with their teammates. That's what you want to exploit. So maybe to exploit that weakness, you would get the puck over near him and create a lack of communication or some confusion between him and his teammate, get him to draw out a position and then pass around him using your teammates position around that side of the, uh, of the ice to exploit that weak player that doesn't know his position or maybe players that get distracted or lose focus. There's times where players will, uh, let's say you're playing, playing basketball and it's such a great deal. Uh, the point guard dribbling down, you're out there on the wing as either a guard or a forward and your man is guarding you. He's up close on you, trying to keep an eye on you, trying to keep an eye on the ball. Well, Let's say your point guard does a little bit of fancy moves, fancy footwork, and trying to put pressure on his man, and your defender is distracted. He looks away from you. He looks at the point guard. He takes his eyes off of you. He's distracted. He loses focus on the person he's actually guarding, which is you. So how do you exploit that? Well, a great way to do that is when he looks away from you and he's not seeing you, bam, that's when you make your move. That's when you make your back cut. That's when you make your... Uh, your sprint down the, uh, down the baseline. That's when you move and get an advantage, you know, a one second advantage they talk a lot about in basketball and get away from your defender, creating that, uh, you know, t- t- exploiting that weakness of him losing focus and getting distracted from his primary job, which is keeping you from scoring. There's another weakness that uh, we talked about being timid or scared, uh, as a mental weakness. There are players that in pressure situations, they, they get what I call a deer in headlights, uh, deer in the headlights look. They, they get scared. You can see their face kind of gets flushed out a little bit. Their eyes kind of bug out a little bit and they, uh, get intimidated and they're afraid of making a mistake. And when that happens, man, that's the person you want to go after. You want to find out who on the other team has that bugged out, scared look and is playing timid. And that's who you want to go after. And, uh, if you've got a corner guarding one of your wide receivers and it's a big part of the game and that corner, uh, your, your wide receiver notices that that corner is playing timid and playing scared, playing not to lose, playing not to make a mistake. That's who you want to go after. All right. And we could go on and on with examples, but let's, let's move forward. Another example are tendencies. Now, tendencies are predictable behaviors. It's something that they do over and over and over again. It's just like an automatic response when, uh, you know, Pavlov's dogs thing, he trained, he trained these dogs that every time he rang a bell, he would give them some food. And, uh, so it got to the point he did this so often, every time he'd ring the bell, the dogs would immediately start salivating because they knew food was next, right? Ding. Oh, here comes food. And they, they, their mouth starts watering. They get ready to eat it. Well, there came a point when he would just ring the bell and not give them food and their mouth would, they would salivate and he could just ding it. And he's like, I could make a dog salivate. Bing. And he'd ring a bell and they'd start salivating. So it was a, it was a tendency. It was a a learned response. Now what happens a lot in sports is players will, they'll get a learned response. They will see something happen. And instead of making sure that it's a, you know, that they, that they've covered all their bases. They just click over into this automatic response, this tendency and move into this position or a, a responsive action to, uh, to respond to that. So 
I'm going to give you an example. I was playing some, uh, some football about seven years ago and, uh, we were lined up, we were playing against a really, really athletic team. I mean, the guy that was guarding me, I was playing wide receiver. And the guy that was guarding me, man, big old strong, uh, about a six foot three, uh, black guy with just amazing talent. And the guy was faster than me and he was longer reach than me. And I mean, the dude was a stud athlete. So I'm thinking, okay, how can I get a type of advantage over this guy? And, uh, and exploit it so I can attack his weakness. So I noticed every time that our quarterback, uh, let's say I was out on the left-hand side, every time our quarterback rotated his shoulders to the right and made a throw over to the right, my guy would peel off of me and start running towards midfield or start running toward the other side of the field to uh, help out on defense, to try to make a tackle in case his teammates didn't uh, miss the tackle or something over there, in case they didn't get our, our guy down. I also noticed that when I came firing off the line, like on a dead sprint, he focused in on me and he just made it his mission to cover me up where I could never get a pass thrown to me. But I also found that if I just kind of lollygagged off the line a little bit, maybe jogged up to him, it, he he saw that as, oh, my guy's not going to get the ball. Look at his body language. He's not even prepared to get the ball. He knows he's not going to get the ball passed to him because they must have called a play for another guy. So I don't even have to guard my guy. I'm going to look around and try to find the dude they're actually going to pass to. So I saw those tendencies, right? He, reading my body language and also reading the, the quarterback to see uh, and to go help out on defense on the other side of the field. So I told my quarterback, I said, hey, on this next play, could you do a fake pass to the right side? And, uh, you know, take it, take your three or five step drop and do a real convincing, sell a nice fake to the, to the opposite side of the field, to the right side. And I'm going to, you know, mess with my guy. I'm going to do this lollygag thing where I come off the line. Looks like I'm not going to get the ball. And as soon as I see my defender's head turn and he takes his eyes off me to go towards you, I'm going to burst past him down the sideline. And I want you to throw it up over the top. So make that fake to the right and then throw it to me over the top. I'm going to be wide open. Quarterbacks say, okay, let's, let's give it a whirl. Well, sure enough, it unfolded exactly like that. Fake pass to the right hand side. I lollygagged off the line like I knew I wasn't getting the ball. The corner peels off of me and starts heading towards the, uh, the opposite side of the field. And I turn on my, my jets and burn past him. Throws me a, I don't know, 30, 40 yard pass over the top. Bam, I'm gone for a touchdown. Seven points. Awesome. All because we have found a tendency of this guy that was guarding me, and we attacked it. All right. So the questions that you need to ask yourself, either before a game or at halftime during a game, these are some questions that you need to ask yourself to help you identify and help remind you to find and attack your opponent's weakness. All right, number one, what is my opponent's weakness? The guy guarding me, okay? How have I succeeded against him? What's his mental weakness? What's his physical weakness? Am I faster? Am I stronger? Am I bigger? Am I more agile? Um, it, it, what's his mental weakness? Is he in the right spot, right position? What's his, uh, tendency? Does he, does he break left every single time I, I push off, you know, what, what are his tendencies? What is the guy across me? What are his weaknesses that I can exploit? Question number two, how have we as a team been scoring or how have we been effective against our opponent? How have we got, if you're in soccer, how have we got the most shot opportunities, the most wide open shots? Sometimes the goalie is just outstanding and it's hard to get a ball past him. But if you are able to get six shots by doing a certain play in, in, in the same thing for hockey, but, uh, in, in soccer and in hockey, if you're able to get, generate lots of shots, even if they aren't falling, that is something you want to keep going. Because like the Brazilians say, if you drip enough water on a rock, eventually you're going to make a hole. You get enough shots on goal, eventually you're going to get through and score a goal. All right, so how have we been scoring, or how have we at least been effective against the teammates, or against the opponents? Third question, how have I beat or gotten the advantage over my defender? All right, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier, but are you bigger than them? Can you push right through them? Are you faster than them? Can you get around them? I remember when I was wrestling back in high school, I was very good at single leg takedowns. So I could win lots of wrestling matches by shooting in, taking a guy down, getting my two points, and then I'd let him back up. He would get one point escape, so I'm ahead two to one. 
Then I would do the same thing, shoot in, take him down. Now I've got four points. Let him up. He's got two. And I kept doing that over and over and over until the match would end, and I outscore the guy by double his points, whatever, however many takedowns I ended up getting. So that was an example of the guy I was going against, I found his weakness, and I kept exploiting him. All right. Another question you want to ask. The fourth question is, who is their worst player? Who uh, on their team, this is not just an individual me versus one guy, but look around the team as a whole. Who is their worst player? Who's the worst player on the field? Who is the one guy that we can really attack as a team and exploit? Uh, the fifth question, how can we get our best player to go against their worst player? In basketball, this is uh, easy as doing a, a pick where you've got your best player comes over to the guy who's got the... Uh, I'm sorry, you have somebody who's being guarded by the uh, the weak player come over and set a screen for your star player, and when they switch and rotate, now you've got the weak guy against your strong guy. Simple, and, and that, that happens in lots of other sports as well. But if you can isolate your best player against their worst player and attack that worst player, that's a recipe for winning. All right. So that is our, uh, just one more summary, find their weakness and attack it. We're attacking their physical weakness, their mental weakness, and their tendencies. And use these questions either when you're preparing for a game, maybe you've got game film from whenever you've played them in the past or from another team playing them so you can identify their weaknesses, or during a halftime at a game, like I told you from the basketball story, we just applied these, these principles, we found their weakness and attacked it, and bam, we had great results, even from not even ever playing this team before and only having one half of experience against them. So that's what you guys need to do. So during the course of this podcast, we always want to be improving and finding better ways to help you out. If you see that we can improve this podcast, if there are questions you have, or if there's any way we can serve you better and add value to you, please reach out to me on Facebook. Again, go to facebook.com forward slash science of winning podcast, or just go to the search bar on Facebook and search science of winning podcast. If you have a sport or a position that you would like us to break down for you, let us know. Just go to facebook.com forward slash science of winning podcast and post a message or private message me, uh, there on the Facebook, uh, on Facebook and I would be happy to get back to you. I'll answer your question. We can chat back and forth and I may even turn it into a podcast for you. And for anyone who goes to our Facebook page and makes a post and asks a question, I'll definitely give you a shout out on our next podcast episode. Now, I am super excited to hear about your dreams and to help you achieve them. If you know any athletes, coaches, or parents of athletes that you think would benefit from this podcast, please tell them about us. And as always, please subscribe to our podcast and give our episodes a rating so we know which ones you like and which ones we can approve. Again, this is Lyndon Gordney, and you are listening to the Science of Winning Podcast.